And good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Perspectives. I'm Darren Jaime. Coming up tonight on Perspectives, we go front and center with the issues in Albany and compare them to what's happening right here in the borough of the Bronx. Our guest in studio, no stranger to us, New York State Senator Jose Serrano, who is of the 28th Senate District, and we thank you for coming and sharing with us here on Perspectives. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you. Good to have you. As we know, a lot has been going on lately, particularly with all of the controversy surrounding uh, the, the upheaval and the coup in Albany. Uh, I know you guys are out right now, but where do things really stand? Well, things are, we're trying to settle things down. I mean, it's been a very tough time uh, to be in Albany. It's been a tough time to be a, a legislator. Um, uh, thankfully, the coup is over. Uh, Democrats are, are now back in power, um, which is important for a lot of the progressive issues that we care about. But I think more importantly, as individual legislators, it, during this summer, we need to focus on policy issues that are important to our district at home. Uh, we need a break from the Albany madness for a while, and we need to just focus on the tasks at hand. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about how you guys are viewed, particularly because the coup's organized by State Senator Pedro Espada. He's from the Bronx. You're a state senator from the Bronx. What's the look like for you guys up in Albany, considering the fact that, okay, Senator Espada's from the Bronx, and so are you guys. Mm -hmm. How are you viewed, if you will? Well, I think for a while there, it, the media and the newspapers were... Uh, every day sort of calling us uh, clowns and, and things of that nature. But um, I think uh, it was important for us individually to focus on issues that uh, were timely, were, were issues that everyone cared about. Um, and um, I think now we're, we're sort of moving past that. Um, there were a number of uh, reforms that were implemented within the state Senate that will make uh, the chamber a, 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 a lot more democratic. Um, so I think that those reforms were a very good first step. It's going to take a while. I think for the public to uh, to feel fully engaged once again with the state senate, but you know what? We just have to work hard and restore that trust. The big news coming out of Albany last week was the de decision for mayoral control. We know that vote went to last week. Uh, something that a lot of people were still a little up in arms about and still not really not sure about. Uh, are you pleased with the way the mayoral control and the decision for mayoral control over city schools? Yes, I am. I supported uh, continuance of mayoral control uh, with some tweaking, and I think. Uh, to an extent, we, we were able to get the concessions from the mayor that we wanted to regarding uh, parental involvement uh, and uh, having uh, the, the community feel vested in a lot of the projects and issues that are important. But, but equally important uh, is uh, something that was very near and dear to me was to have this Arts Advisory Council be part of school governance. It was an issue that I fought for, as you know, the arts is my passion, it's my love, and I think it is really important that students in public education get a quality uh, arts experience in the classroom, arts and music. So I was happy to see that part of this new package, it was one of the amendments that we voted on last year and it passed overwhelmingly. And we know that once the budget does come down, especially in the city school system, Arts and, and, and entertainment and sports, those are usually the ones that really take the right. front line The front line cuts. We'll talk about some of the stuff that you were doing in regards to this bill because uh, there are some things that we want to talk about because there's only 8% of city elementary schools that offer instruction in all four art forms of dance, music, theater, mm -hmm. and visual arts. Only 8%. It's, 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 it's a travesty when you consider that it is the law, it is in statute, that uh, arts education must be mandated, but there is no enforcement. So who is there to watch? Who's the watchdog to make sure that arts education is happening in our, in our children's public school? It's not. Now, I don't need to point to any of the numerous studies which show that arts and music education improves outcomes in reading and math and other subjects. Uh, also provides some wonderful outlets for our students and provides career opportunities down the road. Uh, but it's, it's been something that I think uh, school administrators and elected officials alike believe well, arts education, is it really that important? Does it really make a difference? Every study has proven that it is. Uh, this bill and, and this amendment that I put in will create oversight. Um, and there's another piece of legislation I have in the Senate that will create an independent auditor to cut through all the, uh, um, you know, the red tape and find out, is exact, uh, are we exactly only doing 8%? 
Um, and if 8% is all we can achieve, then we're making a huge uh, mistake and we have to do better. Because compliance is one of the major things that we need to find out about. And how do you go about dealing with the issue of compliance? Because even though arts and education, I mean, arts programs are out there, it's very hard to monitor how many people are really dealing in the yeah. arts. Well, I think it's also about changing people's thinking about education. That yes, reading, math, social studies, pillars within uh, a child's education. But we have to start thinking about the arts and music as pillars. Because if we don't give them that, they will not be rounded, well-rounded people. They will not have the educational tools that they need to succeed in other things in life in higher education. It's been proven time and time again. If we have the arts mandated on a much higher scale, get it up to 100%, you will see dropout rates decline. You will see test scores improve. You've been a longtime defender of immigrant rights. Going to shift gears here. Talk to us a little bit about your work in wanting to protect uh, immigrants and, and particularly undocumented immigrants because there's some legislation out there that could be coming down to really protect those. Right. There's a couple of things that I've been working on. We have an anti deportation task force that I've set up uh, with concerned elected officials throughout my district um, uh, uh, looking at illegal deportation. 100,000 people. Um, at, uh, at annually are deported illegally in this country. Um, and, and I think that's very unfair when you consider that this nation was founded on immigration. Um, and immigrants are hardworking people for the most part and they love this country and they want to be here and they have a right to be here. Um, but there is a lot of illegal uh, deportations that are going on uh, and we need to fight that. Uh, one of the ways that we're doing that is through setting up this task force, doing a letter writing campaign, trying to hear testimonials from people whose families have been destroyed because a father, a mother, an uncle, a son or a daughter has been illegally deported um, when they should be here. Um, also highlighting the fact that there is no real path to uh, documentation, to citizenship in this nation. And also looking at the role that uh, ICE, or the, the, which is the new version of INS, or immigration authorities, are playing in our prison system. I think about 13,000 uh, folks have been deported um, out of our prison system. They were found in the prison system and they shouldn't be. I think we need to separate those two things because if someone's arrested and they're cleared uh, of wrongdoing, they shouldn't have to take a double whammy because now immigration is going to be on them because they're going to ask them questions. Uh, in the city of New York, we have Executive Order 41, which provides sanctuary for immigrants, and you cannot be asked your immigration status. I have a bill on the state level to make the entire state of New York a sanctuary state so that no, one, no state agency can ask anyone on their immigration status. But you do have some critics out there who say this, is a little, this goes a little bit too far. How do you defend that to your critics who say, listen, you know, that's, that, that might be good. Now to take it and branch it out to the state, uh, you, you got some people up in arms here. Well, I think it's a good policy because what you have now is immigrants who are in the shadows. Look, the bottom line is they're going to be here whether we do this or not. Immigrants are coming in. They want to work. They want to help their families. They want to achieve the American dream. But let's put together some bills that bring people out of the shadows um, and also help them when they've been the victims of crimes and fraud. Right now, immigrants who are a little bit nervous about their paperwork will not come forward when they're the victims of crime, violent crime, a mugging. We see that happen all the time. They won't go to the police. But the police are there to protect them, and they will protect them. These bills will help them come out of the shadows and feel protected. We'll come back and talk a little bit more about immigration, not only about immigration, but some other legislation that State Senator Serrano is trying to work on here in the borough of the Bronx. He is our guest in studio. Stay with us. We're taking a quick break. Coming right back. <laughs> 